but yeah. Uh, it's a very, it's called the Garden of England, uh, and it's really lovely to look at from the air. When you're down on the ground, it's like lots of places in England, extremely dangerous because we're so densely populated. It really is. You can't go walking in the English countryside easily now. You can't go walking in the lanes because of the traffic. Uh, but it is very, it's very pleasant there, and we can see on a clear day, you know, you can see France. And we, I can be in Paris, allowing, say, a ten-minute journey to Ashford Station near me. I can be in Paris two hours later for breakfast on the Eurostar train. We have had a big development in that way since we became members of Europe. So we go under the channel on trains now. That's good. So you can get mugged in Ashford <laughs> before breakfast and get mugged in Paris again. And, and it comes right up in the middle of Paris. I mean, I'm not, you know, none of these airport jobs. It comes right up in the Gare du Nord. Yes, sir. Well, medics actually, you know, was about realistic anxieties, wasn't it? It was about the anxieties of health. I mean, thank God you all look healthy here. And no one looks as if you need to worry about that for a while yet. But, I mean, hospital politics in, Ameri in, uh, in, uh, where do I live? in England um, are very, very acute, you know, because we are looking, I suppose, I mean, you must understand, I'm talking uh, just as Tom Baker here, so largely out of ignorance. But there's a great preoccupation, obviously, in England about the decline of the National Health Service, which makes people very, very nervous. Um, and so, obviously, a lot of medics was about this, you know, internecine warfare of people, you know, hustling for shares of a budget or whatever it was. Because, you know, hard questions need to be asked now. I was re reminding one of my colleagues recently that in the early 1940s, after the war, one of the great founders of national health in, in England said, the beauty of the national health scheme is that every year the, the health service will become cheaper. As the, na as the nation's health gets better. It was a marvellous, innocent observation. Of course, it was entirely wrong. And so now we're into situations now, aren't we, to give one man a, a new heart, which might cost half a million or a million pounds, with the whole preparation, against, you know, two or three hundred or five hundred people having hip replacements. These are hard things. And so medics was not nearly so much fun as Doctor Who. It wasn't. It really wasn't. Because it was about real anxieties, you know. So quite often it depressed me, really. But I tried to rev it up. Got a few laughs. Yes. Yes. Well, I don't know that I remember very much about movies at all. I think I've done about, I can't remember, maybe 15 movies, I don't know. But they all seem to me to be, uh, except one or two, you know, where there are huge budgets. And so it was a hell of a wheeze, and you were, you know, walking around uh, or being driven around in big cars. Because, I mean, when I became an actor, you know, I wasn't really thinking about the kind of morality of art or truth or... I was thinking really about the billing and, um, and big cars, really. You know, I mean, that, <laughs> when you're no good at school and you're, you can't earn a living at anything, naturally people say, have you thought about becoming an actor? <laughs> if you can't do anything else. And that's why a lot of young people, because in, in Europe we have situations 17 million unemployed in the European community. So for the first time since the Industrial Revolution, we have, would one say millions? I suppose out of 17 million, yeah. We have, we have hundreds of thousands or millions of young people for the first time since the Industrial Revolution are not wanted by society. I don't mean that they're not loved by society, they're not wanted by society at large because there is nothing for them to do. But that's a depressing thought. So uh, that's why lots of them want to get into show business. During the Depression in America, everyone trekked west to get into movies. Uh, here, everyone treks to Shortland Street, is it? <laughs> Shortland Road? Um, Try and get in that, yeah? <laughs> what? I don't think anyone said that you opened my eyes to the universe, but lots of people have said to me, I looked at Tom Baker and I thought, if he can do it, <laughs> surely I can do it. And they were absolutely right. So in a sense, I have inspired thousands and thousands of young people. And they've waved to me as they've shot past me on the way going like that, yeah. <laughs> I don't mind about that, yeah. Anyone down there? No? We'll go here, yep. 
Yes. Well, it was terrific fun working with John Cleese, yes, because he is so staggeringly funny. No, I found it rather dull working with uh, Rowan, because Rowan is uh, um, incredibly intelligent. I mean, you know, he's, very, he's a great scientist, you know, he got a first in electronics at Oxford, and then he did sarcasm at Cambridge. <laughs> um, and he's, and he's got marvellous glossy hair and a wonderful complexion and wonderful teeth. He hasn't got a single filling. And, uh, uh, and then he went on to Edinburgh University where he did wisdom. So he's a right bloody know-all altogether. <laughs> and uh, so when you're working with him, he's very likely to tell you how to do things, you know. And it will be a terrible mistake to listen to him because <laughs> while he's terrific at doing his own number, uh, you know, you've got to leave other people to do it. So that was a bit boring, really. Well, it was Stephen was in it and you know, and Baldrick and all that crap. I said, they were all right, Miranda Richardson. But uh, with uh, John Cleese, it was a scream, you know, because John is always on the... I mean, he, he would have been an amazing Doctor Who, wouldn't he? Yeah. Because you always think he'll fragment at any moment, you know. Uh, and he, he was just very, very funny. Very funny to be... A uh, dear man, a very, very serious man, and uh, very concerned about everything, and worries about everything, and very, very generous. Uh, yes, so that's it. Any dream roles that I want to play? Well, I mean, it's not as if, you know, roles are being thrown at me left, right, and center, unless I'm in a banquet or something like that. But the, uh, <laughs> the, um, well, you know, when I was young, I was deeply, deeply religious. And uh, I think I, I have to confess these things. We must be free in New Zealand, you know, and not be repressed. Uh, I think actually what drew me first to, uh, religion was I was um, living a rather boring life in Liverpool and I, was, became, I started sniffing very early uh, at mass because in those days we used to use a lot more incense than we use now and I didn't realize it, no one else realized it, I was absolutely hooked on sniffing incense, you know. And so, at, uh, so I was hallucinating at an early age with past, with past of being, you know, pious. <laughs> They said, that boy, you know, he really sees things. They didn't know. They didn't know, you know, I was using that much charcoal and holding the thurible very close to my nose as the priest put the fine uh, incense on. And then I liked all the clothes, you know, all those long clothes. In other words, I like dressing up in frocks, really. And I realize now this impulse hasn't entirely left me because I keep having a, a, a real desire to, because I'm a great admirer of Oscar Wilde and all that kind of jolly line of, you know, uh, Wits. I have a great desire to play Lady Bracknell. Um, but, you know, absolutely straight. Really, I'd like to play her straight with, with a big headdress and high heel shoes, so that I was about seven foot four, yeah. And, and, uh, and yeah, quite fierce, yes, because it's a most marvelous play. I, I read it very often. I love it, yes. Anyone else? Yes. What made me, I told you what made me go into acting, you know, I couldn't earn a living. Um, and when I was in the army, it was easy, you know, I just started a long time ago. It, it really started when in, uh, in the war, when the Germans were bombing um, Liverpool. And I've never stopped being grateful to the Germans. I always, uh, you know, well, I'm, I'm nice to German people because they really revved my childhood up and broke the monotony. And it was great seeing buildings ablaze and... Uh, and so you didn't go to school much because the schools were on fire. <laughs> And so, you know, children like that, don't they? We were going around collecting, you know, fragments of bombs called shrapnel because you didn't, you know, I just thought it was marvelous, really. In fact, my earliest ambition, I've been writing about this recently, my earliest ambition was to be an orphan. <laughs> and uh, well, that sounds awful now. I mean, that was my ambition. And, and now, you know, I look back and could weep at the thought of how much my mother loved me and how much I loved her. But at the time, I wanted to be an orphan when I was little. Children could be corrupted very early. And the reason was, if your mother was blown up by a German, uh, then you've got presents from America. You've got those funny hats, you know, and, uh, and sweaters and, and crossword puzzles. You know, the Americans, they kind of bomb you in, into, uh, into accepting aid, you know, or they're always great on sending you presents like that. And so instantly, what they did was that the kids who were, who were orphaned were hated by those of us who still had our mothers. Because it seemed to me, as it would to a child, wouldn't it, that there was an advantage to being an orphan. This is wrong, you know. It is not an advantage to be an orphan generally speaking. So I was praying away, you know, imploring God and singing to him, you know, because he likes to be serenaded. I was imploring him to make me an orphan. I remember when I told my mother about it, she hit me so hard <laughs> that I fell against a sideboard on which there was a kind of uh, carved uh, bowl of fruit. And until quite recently, 
the, uh, it was on my passport. It said, you know, bunch of grapes. And, it left, uh, and it's only gone recently, since I got married. Yeah? Is it true I don't like her? Oh, no, I'm sure I loved her. Louise Jameson. I may have put, sometimes, you know, when you're, when you're in a series and you've got to talk every week about it or whatever it is, it's quite nice not to make it all sweetness and light, you know, because I told you, you know, happiness is death to the ratings. Uh, you know, what, what people thrive on, the trivial area of television, you know, is, is anxiety and double talk and lies and betrayal, like any soap opera, really. And so, you know, if you put it round that you don't like Louise, that's going to get you more publicity than if you say, oh, she's a sweet girl, you know, and, uh, you know, I, and I'm always, you know, you know, bouncing her baby on my knee. That's boring, that, to the press. They don't want to know that. No, I was very fond of her. I was obviously fonder of some girls than I was of others. I hope you'll forgive me for that. I actually married one of them due to a misunderstanding. <laughs> I mean, I do remember, I think about her very affectionately now because it was a very brief thing, like some misunderstandings are. And I do remember that she said a very witty thing because she was a bright girl. In, a, in America, she was at some university or something. Uh, and so someone said, this is Lala Ward I'm talking about, and f with whom, of whom I have great memories. And she said, somebody said, who was your favorite monster? And quick as a flash, you said, Tom Baker. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> yeah, yes. She's married again and is very happy now, yes. <laughs> yes, sir? I never met the other doctors except by accident. Uh, and I, t I avoid them like the plague if I possibly can. I think it's absolutely pathetic to see a, a kind of clutch of shagged out old Doctor Who's all together. <laughs> uh, I really do. I avoid them like the plague. And also, they're much nicer than me. You know, they're very good mannered because they're BBC chaps. And, I, and in, fact, in fact, they're worse than good mannered. They're bloody charming. And if there's something I can't stand, it's charm. I really think that charm is a suspect quality. You know, charm is a kind of uh, facility that people have of switching it on, don't they? They say, go on get over there and put the charm on. As soon as someone's charming to me, I get restless. Right, so that's done the Doctor Who's. Yeah? Um, you didn't give the five doctors, but I remember saying the whole thing was I wasn't in the five doctors. I'll tell you something, I wasn't in the five doctors, and so unimportant was my performance in Doctor Who. I refused to be in it because they had better lines than I had. Um, and so I said, I'm not being in it unless I have the best lines. And they were all saying, well, I want the best lines. It was really quite grown up. Um, so I refused to be in it. And you know what? They, you know what they did? The buggers, they went down to Madame Tussauds, which is the waxworks, and they hauled me out of the waxworks <laughs> and put me in the bloody film. And they had another fellow running around, you know, in the middle shot, dressed up as me. I wasn't in the film, and yet everyone thinks I was. I mean, they had to pay me for that uh, wax performance. But no, no one noticed it. People, no one noticed it at all. So, you see, I've got no grand ideas about my, uh, yes. Yes. I am. I have a book coming out um, in, Nove in uh, October, October, November for the Christmas market. It'll be out here, yes. I accepted some money f to tell my story. Uh, and it's called, we, I was going to call it All Friends Betrayed, because that sounds about sums it up, really. Uh, you know, the kind of Judas of equity. But that only sprang out of anxiety. But now it's a kind of pun now. So it's called Who on Earth? is Tom Baker, and that's what it's called, yes. And uh, I was rereading it recently because I've got to deliver the last few words when I get back next week. Uh, and I read it, reread it recently, and it's just an appalling story. I mean, it really is a dreadful story. I scarcely believed a word of it. <laughs> but it might amuse you, yes? Well, I will mention my um, visit to New Zealand because extraordinary things happen. Uh, somebody rang up last night who was at school with me and I had a long, he lives in Wellington and, uh, and he told me a story that was all very nice, you know, uh, and, and heartfelt and it catapulted him back over so many years and I remembered him quite well and he was rather touched about that and then uh, what else happened all in the space of a day? Oh yes, I'd finished, I had about 500 photographs taken of myself yesterday then I had a conversation with a fellow from Donkeys half a century ago and then I'm sta I went into Chin Chins, you know, on the, on the waterfront where Sir Anthony Hopkins, I think, is at the moment working as a waiter, obviously rehearsing a, a, a film. I mean, it is, honestly. I said, 
I said, Tony. He said, shh. <laughs> and he's, he's going round, you know, slightly stooped and charming everybody. And I said, you're Tony Hopkins. And he said, shh. He said, I'm, they call me Rolf, actually. I'm Austrian. But it was obviously Tony Hopkins. Anyway, that was quite impressive. And, um, and so he said to me, uh, if you don't stop calling me Tony Hopkins, I'll call you John Pertwee, which <laughs> really wounded me, you know. I mean, I wouldn't, it wouldn't have wounded me if John had been alive. It was the fact that John was dead. But anyway, so anyway, I have this quite nice, charming dinner and, uh, and with my wife, and uh, we didn't speak much. And, um, and then I sent for the bill, and, and, uh, and Anthony, Anthony said, uh, so you said your bill's been paid for. I said, what? He said, someone's paid your bill. I said, oh, come on. I said, I can't have people paying my bill in restaurants like that. Uh, you know, this is silly. Thank whoever it was who wants to take my bill. Uh, he said, no, it's paid for. So he said, a friend of yours. He said, he knows you very well. So I went over, uh, and there was this terribly good-looking, vigorous young fella in his mid-thirties, curly hair and nice eyes, a lovely, reckless smile. And I thought, I thought he looked familiar. And I said, because I come from quite a big family, I said, are you a Fleming? He said, no, I'm a baker. I'm your son, Piers. <laughs> Honestly, I'm Louise Robert, I swear to God, that was happened last night in New Zealand. Isn't that amazing? And he wasn't at all uh, annoyed that I didn't recognize him. <laughs> and he is so well, and he actually uh, graphs. Uh, he's a very, very highly accomplished uh, horticulturalist, or whatever you call it. And he can graph trees and shrubs, and especially roses. Uh, and they fly him in, he works here, and then he goes back to the south of France and gradually works his way. I knew he worked in Europe a lot, that's why I don't see him much. Um, because actually, I come from a very fragmented sort of family, and I, I, I'm often quite... Once I was outside BAFTA, which is the British Academy of Films, uh, in, in Piccadilly, not long ago, as in last year, and there was some sort of do going on there, so they dragged people back, you know, and we were all amazed and said, gosh, are you still alive, and all that sort of thing. <laughs> and I was desperately hoping you'd be given the part of the father of Lazarus or something like that. And suddenly, a, a, a voice, a girl said to me, here, girl, I just had my beer, voice, she said, hello, Tom. You know, the awful inflection, which means, aren't you going to be surprised when you turn round? So I put my beer down, and I turned round, and there was this woman. I said, ah, I said, hi there, how are you? She said, you don't recognize me, do you? I said, bah. We've played this scene a thousand times before. <laughs> I said, of course I do. I said, remember you? National Theatre, 1974. She said, no, it wasn't. I said, no, of course it wasn't. <laughs> I had to do what Del Boy does in Any Fools and Horses. You know, Monge too, he says, instead of Monge. I said, of course not. It was the Royal Shakespeare Company. As you like it, wasn't it? She said, no, it wasn't. So anyway, I, I, could, I could tell this story in real time, but you'd grow old. <laughs> I said, I, of course not. I said, I, Granada Television play for today. She said, no, it wasn't. And I said, if only I had faith, I thought, and could make this girl disappear. <laughs> and she obviously wasn't going to disappear. So I said, no, I'm so sorry. I said, but it was a play, wasn't it? She said, no, we used to be married. <laughs> it's extraordinary, isn't it? You know? So I reached for my beer like that, and I had a pull at it. When I turned around, she'd gone. So I couldn't be certain whether she had been married to me or not. <laughs> but that's one of the things, you know, as the, as the parts and the memories all kind of intertwined so that one doesn't really know where one is uh, or who, indeed who one is because you know one of the one of the problems is people, some people get rattled about not knowing who they are but I've come to terms with it yes anyone else Go on. well not very often I mean I'm excited to see you because you definitely you've never seen me before except on television I've certainly never seen you uh, I've never seen you before so it's brand new but all the old Doctor Who's are always, you know, all the motorways. It's a bloody place is full of old Doctor Who's. <laughs> thumbing their way to Manchester, you know, <laughs> to go and meet the fans, you know. Uh, and the fans give them sandwiches and things like that, and sometimes give them a lift back to the motorway. <laughs> uh, and if I wanted to go to America, where, as you know, science fantasy and science fiction is very, very big business, uh, uh, then I could obviously live in America going uh, with the Trekkies who go, oh, you know, Friday, Saturday and Sunday in all the big cities. There are very serious science fantasy conventions on a very big scale 
with lots of merchandising and, uh, and of course the Americans are in such a huge country, are so excited to meet each other. And then they say, I'll see you next week in Kansas, you know. So you've got to keep notes about the jokes you crack uh, in America. I could do that all the time if I wanted to, but uh, again, I'd be stuck with this British contingent, you know. Um, and so I don't do that. Occasionally, you know, actually, look, the Christmas before last, I went to New York and recited a Christmas carol. I made them all cry. They liked that, yeah. I adored them. Yes, they all wept and wept. It was amazing, yes. I haven't been offered a role in Star Trek, and, I, and I, the reason why I would never be offered a role in Star Trek, you've only got to watch that kind of thing. I mean, the style of Star Trek is the absence of emotion, isn't it? And everyone has obviously, you know, had a lot of prunes the day before yesterday. <laughs> and there's absolutely nowhere to go. The nearest lavatory is about four miles down the road, you know, <laughs> a, a, about as far as Kelly Tarleton's. And this leads to a kind of very serious sort of acting, doesn't it? You know, so they can't move suddenly. Of course they can't move suddenly. Or they couldn't, I mean, you couldn't in Star Trek even cough. You've never seen anyone go <coughs> in Star Trek, have you? They just don't do that sort of thing. It's a, kind of, their style is this kind of, my God, isn't this serious, isn't it? You know, they nod a lot, don't they? Huh? And no one actually says, that's ridiculous. You know, they never say that, do they? It's amazing. They, they, they all nod away as if they're talking like characters in Hamlet. Yes, ma'am?